I first met him uh, kind of on a lark. I, I used to go down to Mayo once in a while at the request of Dr. Bob Fry, who's a senior person down there, who um, uh, asked if I would make rounds with him. If you ever get a chance to make rounds with Dr. Fry, definitely do it. He's a, a tremendous teacher. And Scott was in the CCU uh, one of those days, and we said hello and shook hands, and we've been friends ever since. I run into him all over the world. Last time I saw him, we were in Amsterdam together. And uh, so he's a good friend, and I know that he is an extraordinary uh, clinician and highly regarded at the Mayo Clinic and a great educator. Um, he's also quite involved in clinical trials. Um, he's focused. He's he spent a lot of time, I think, in their coronary care unit. He's interested in acute coronary syndromes, but he's also interested in lipid metabolism and anti-lipid therapy. So we're delighted to have Scott up. He's also a longtime friend of Ganesh's, and um, we thought this was a terrific uh, idea to have him, and I hope you enjoyed him for the first part of the session. So without further ado, Scott, we'll turn it over to you. Gary, thank you very much. And <clears throat> it's, first of all, a privilege to be at the University of Minnesota, a historic place in the development of cardiovascular therapies. As I talked earlier, uh, this place is, is really full of tradition and discovery uh, of everything that's been done starting in the 50s and 60s with cardiopulmonary bypass, the 70s, the concept of vasodilator therapy and neurohumeral modulation for heart failure, the 80s, lipid modifying therapy with lifestyle modification with the POSH surgery, and then just going forward and, and continuing to go on. And of course, it is the academic center of, of Minnesota and uh, drives a lot of the innovation in the state. And uh, I benefit, and all of us do, from your stewardship and uh, you know, Gary has been a great friend and a great teacher so many years. We met in Red Wing many times when we used to have a Mayo, a Mayo U of M heart failure meeting quarterly on research. It was one of those great times when we all weren't so busy and we could talk about ideas and have dinner. And then um, I had the privilege when Gary was at Cleveland Clinic to work alongside him on the Valiant trial. We both managed consortiums. We had some sites from Mayo and he had the Cleveland sites. And um, I just admired Gary and, and always learned uh, a lot about how he managed physicians and managed investigators. And, uh, you know, there's, in my mind, no better uh, clinician and cardiologist than, than Gary Francis. So, Gary, thanks for that very kind introduction. And uh, uh, it was great to see you in Amsterdam. It's even greater to see you in Minneapolis uh, tonight. And Ganesh, thanks for the invitation and uh, Congratulations on all you're doing here. We we still miss Ganesh from our practice, and we're glad that he's here and not left Minnesota. I have been interested in lipids since before medical school. In, in the 80s, uh, uh, about the time I was in college and then started medical school, cholesterol was the buzz uh, in society. And much of what we deal with today in terms of metabolic syndrome probably stems from the efforts of society to decrease fat and cholesterol intake and push us into eating carbs in the 80s, right? And then in medical school, I did a, a couple of summers of research with Jim Anderson, a former Mayo alumnus who was at the University of Kentucky, an endocrinologist on looking at how we could lower cholesterol with dietary fiber and trying to figure out what worked, what, what, how, did, how did fiber do it? Did it lower it by uh, just replacing calories, fat for carbohydrates, or did it do something more? And my first paper was on the fact that propionic acid, which is the fermentation product in the gut from fiber, inhibits HMG coesynthase, not reductase, but synthase. And so it, it partnered with statins. And I got interested in statins at the time. And when I came to Mayo in 89, after medical school, I worked with uh, Dr. Palumbo and others. And I said, are we going to use a statin? And they all said to me, no, we want to wait till the patients have a heart attack. <laughs> and we'll treat them. We want to save those until it's really important. And... Uh, so I've had an interest in, in, in really aggressively using statins to treat uh, patients with cardiovascular disease, and I'm going to give you a little bit of my perspective on where we've been, where we, where we are, and where we might, might go. Uh, and I've spent the last 10 years really working on HDL, uh, mostly HDL, now a bit now I'm back with LDL, and uh, I've been involved in some big programs that failed, and it's really great to be involved in programs. It's not good to be involved in programs that fail, but that's medicine. And uh, I remember coming to uh, Roche's headquarters in Basel three or four years ago now at the request of their COO, who's now CEO of AstraZeneca. Uh, 
and he wanted to bring in the PIs from several of the big roast trials because he wanted the study teams, the seven or eight hundred people in Basel who worked behind the scenes anonymously on the big trials to understand why we thought the trials were important and, and to talk about why they didn't work and how that was okay. Because if companies don't take risks, then they never get any kind of uh, uh, advances. And uh, it was sort of a celebration. It was not necessarily a memorial service, but a celebration of the work we did, even though it didn't work. And I thought that was a pretty pro profound thing. And, and of course, if you know Pascal Soriat, who organized this, he's a very visionary guy in the whole uh, industry of, of, of medicine. So I want to go over my disclosures. They all have to do with clinical trial work that I'm doing. I'm involved in a in the omega fatty acid study with AstraZeneca on the steering committee uh, with Pfizer on their PSC, PCSK9 antibody drugs uh, with Sanofi uh, as an advisor on their PCSK9 studies with, with Re, uh, Regeneron for the same. The medicines company, we have some exciting new things now with uh, IV HDL making a comeback as well as a new PCSK9 drug. And then Barrett, Ingelheim and Lilly with their diabetic medications. So, so 30 years since we've been having access to statins, things have changed, right? We've had some progress, but let's look back 30 years. What was the price of gas 30 years ago? And when I put this talk together in the fall, gas was a bit more expensive than it is today. Uh, the median home cost has gone up. It's more than doubled in 30 years. Yearly income has more than doubled. New cars have certainly gotten expensive, and I didn't even average the Tesla car cost into this, Ganesh, the 9000 to 33.5, right? Postage stamps, they've only really doubled in price. Movie tickets, they've kind of gotten pricey. They've almost quadrupled. But some things are the same. Um, the uh, people running for president, planning in 85, were, were Governor Clinton and uh, Vice President Bush. And, well, we still have those two names running for president in 2016. And then, of course, the NBA Rookie of the Year was Michael Jordan. Most of us know who he was, right? Very famous. How many of you know who Andrew Wiggins is? I didn't. I'm embarrassed to say, but he was rookie. Is he a Timberwolf player? He was. Okay, yeah. So uh, impressive, you know. I have to say too that I went to the University of Kentucky, which is a basketball program, uh, a bit ahead of academics, unfortunately. Uh, but my wife has completely converted to be a Minnesota Gopher fan, and uh, for Christmas I gave her the best gift this year, Gary. I gave her a nice jacket with the Gophers insignia on it, and she's just a big fan. We've got to bring her to a game sometime. We're all watching with great interest your young coach, Richard Pitino, I might add, because we were at Kentucky when his father coached uh, the Kentucky team to the national championship. What was the major news in 85? Well, the FDA had just approved a blood test for AIDS. Isn't that interesting? Now we use it all the time. The first dot-com domain name was available. <laughs> now we're out of those. Microsoft had just released the first version of Windows 1.0. Switzerland was the first country to bring into law catalytic converters to be fitted to private cars, leave it to the Swiss. The American consumer had a radical new thing for computers called compact disks. The space shuttle Atlantis had been launched. The United Kingdom was now screening blood donations for AIDS, and the British scientists had discovered a hole in the Earth's ozone layer. That was 85. 2015, the FDA has now suspended testing for micropuncture testing, right? So. Uh, web domains are so oversubscribed that new ones are being released. Microsoft has gone from Windows 1 to 10. And in Switzerland, despite their progressiveness in 85, now the anti-immigration party has won election as it slid to the right. Compact disks are still in use, but only by those who are refusing to upgrade to flash. Uh, the U.S. is not capable of launching our own astronauts into space. We're paying the Russian Federation to do it for us. Did you ever imagine that would be the case? UK consumers are asking for healthy fuel beverages, and nearly all scientists now worry about the Earth's ozone layer. So, have we come a long way on lipids? Well, Dave Barry has said that it's a scientific fact that your body will not absorb cholesterol if you take it from another person's plate. So that's, that's kind of what public thinks today about lipids. And if we go to another reputable source, Pope Francis, he has doesn't really have a high opinion about cholesterol. He says, I see the church as a field hospital after battle. It is useless to ask a seriously injured person if he or she has a high cholesterol. So he's not so up on that. So, you know, but I think the goal for this is really to stop a heart attack. <coughs> Gary, do you know this doctor? This is Mike, I think it's Fockenbaum or Fockenbaum from Cleveland. He was showing a new uh, 64 slice CT scanner 
uh, this was about the time Katrina happened. I remember seeing this this uh, time cover. And uh, he CT scanned himself, and he found uh, that he had a blockage in his LAD. And he was showing the journalist. Uh, so he got so concerned about it, he had a sense the next day and got that blockage fixed. Now, he was asymptomatic, and we could discuss whether uh, he uh, needed a stent, but uh, I don't blame him. I would have one, too, if I had a 90% blockage in my mid-LAD. So what have we studied in terms of lipid-lowering therapy? These were the options when I was a fellow. Uh, we had uh, all kinds of uh, diets. We had the Dean Ornish program, and he was on public radio yesterday. I heard a special about him. Niacin, statins, flaxseed, oat bran, plant steroid, esters. Tom Kotke pushed those a lot. Uh, you, some of you know Tom. Psyllium, fibric acid agents, soy protein, omega fish oils, garlic, now that's common, uh, resin binding agents. So, you know, I'm not going to skip through that. Every, you guys are very familiar with lipids, and I'm not going to go over what lipids are because we know that. But I just want to show you this slide. This comes from Jamie O'Keefe's work that he did as an editorial looking at various populations of people, showing that in the world where populations are really hunter-gatherers, the, the average cholesterol in the body is quite low. Total cholesterol range is about 95 to 105, 115. But when you're at the information gatherer population, like the adult American, that total cholesterol goes up to about 210, okay? And uh, we know that uh, epidemiologically, uh, elevations of atherogenic lipoproteins, namely non-HDL cholesterol, which captures all of the ApoB-containing proteins, LDL and VLDL, are very directly linked. The higher the non-HDL, the greater your risk of developing uh, coronary heart disease. And that for whatever reason, HDL seems to be inversely related, that the higher the HDL that you have in a population, the lower your risks of developing coronary heart disease. Now, that hasn't always translated into success when we modulate HDL. In fact, it hasn't at all, except with the one trial from the VA here with Hannah Rubens. Uh, but uh, it seems to be an observation epidemiologically. And then this, of course, is the current paradigm that we go through for atherosclerosis. Uh, Valentin Fuster broadened this paradigm a few years ago, so we think of it as the atheroinflammatory thrombotic cascade. And that basically oxidized LDL, or ApoB-containing lipoprotein particles, are taken into the subentimal space. And there they are uh, become quite toxic. They interact and become toxic, secreting cytokines that, that are inflammatory, that lead to weakening of the fibrous calf, that lead to the attraction of monocytes, which become macrophages. And then that is the body's immune reaction to try to eat up this cholesterol or phagocytize, and that leads to the form formation of the foam cell and leads to what we now know as atherosclerosis. And we, I think, have consistently seen that if we can lower LDL, then we can successfully treat that. Now, what's really surprising, at least to me, is that atherosclerosis is a lifetime process that starts very early. This is data taken from Los Angeles, looking at largely patients who die violent deaths, either suicide, gunshot wounds, automobile accidents, you name it. And if you look at grade two atherosclerosis, and I'm not an intravascular ultrasound expert, but grade two atherosclerosis is, is at least enough plaque to probably rupture and cause a uh, myocardial infarction. In the second decade of life, 20% or so of people have that. By the third decade of life, 40% do. And by the sixth decade or age 50, over 80% of people have enough plaque to have an acute coronary syndrome and that it has developed over a lifetime. And in fact, if you look, grade one atherosclerosis starts very early and then it's replaced by grades two, three, and four as we age. This is a direct consequence of what we think is uh, the Western lifestyle, or at least we thought it was, until uh, several people, including uh, Randy Thompson and uh, Dr. Allen, published in Jack Imaging a study they did on mummies discovered from uh, the Middle East. And they actually found coronary calcium re reflecting cardiac plaque in individuals dating back several millennia before we were measuring CRP and before we had uh, widespread tobacco use, before we had widespread and small particle matter from industrial pollution and uh, the stressful lifestyles we lead. And if you look back uh, to several now 4,000 years ago, you can see that uh, individuals who died in that time frame were also having coronary atherosclerosis. So whatever the disease is that we're treating, it's been going on for a long time in the human race. 
and uh, it appears to be in part related to blood lipids. We know that they develop or contribute directly and indirectly to that. And we also know that sort of time and grade, that is how much LDL cholesterol you're exposed to over what period of time, really does predict your risk of developing cardiovascular disease. So if you look at those who, uh, for whatever example, have very low, have, have lower than median, below median levels of LDL cholesterol, over time they may develop coronary artery disease, but it's delayed uh, into the seventh or eighth decades of life. And if you take someone who's a homozygous FH patient who has no LDL clearance receptor, they tend to develop fatal heart disease very early in life and having myocardial infarctions in their mid-20s to mid-30s. So the uh, degree of risk of, uh, of what happens is in part related to where you are when you start having symptomatic coronary heart disease. If we take those who have positive coronary calcium scans, for example, or have evidence of mild atherosclerosis, their risks of developing an ischemic event are not quite as high as we might like to believe they are. Annual event rates are 5 to 10 percent, perhaps. I'm sorry, four-year event rates are 5 to 10 percent. Annual event rates are 1 to 2 percent. If you take those who have had a prior ischemic event, though, like someone with a recent acute coronary syndrome, they have much higher event rates. So whatever triggers atherosclerosis to become unstable uh, is a process that then elevates your subsequent risks for events going on beyond that. So largely we have treated atherosclerosis with statin drugs, and these are the available drugs that we have today in 2016 to treat. We also have, I think, patavastatin, which I didn't list. And then we have a number of other agents that we can add, uh, which don't really have a lot of outcome data. Uh, the resin binding drugs, azetamibe, niacin, gemfibrozil, and the fibrates. But I think our patients really care about can we really prevent a heart attack for that. So let's look at where we are in terms of getting that. The world changed in the mid-90s when the statin trials started coming out. Now, these were started in the late 80s, uh, but we saw uh, six mega trials published in the 1990s, which really demonstrated for the first time the benefits of primary and secondary prevention. The first was the West of Scotland study. Now, for most of you, this is not a study that you recall. You've read about it. Uh, for those of us who were in medicine in the 90s, this was a study that was really revolutionary. It was the first time that you could actually show that treating LDL cholesterol reduced subsequent cardiovascular events. Now, in Scotland, they randomized largely men, 6,595, who did not have CAD symptoms, although if you read the fine print, I think one or two of these patients had symptomatic angina but very high LDL values, 155 to 170. Uh, and they followed them for five years and found much to the surprise and delight of everyone that mortality was reduced by about 25%. Non-fatal infarcts were reduced substantially over 30%. Cardiovascular death was reduced, as was the need for revascularization. This was the first time that we had ever shown that you could reduce the need for bypass or PCI with medical therapy. Kind of interesting, wasn't it? This was soon followed by a second primary prevention trial about six years later called the afcaps TexCAPS trial. Now, let's look just for a moment and compare West of Scotland. Look at those LDL values, quite high. And let's go forward to afcaps TexCAPS, which took patients with much lower LDL values. So total cholesterols of 180 to 260, kind of average for what we see today. HDLs that were below median, they were then randomized to lovastatin or placebo for five years, and much to... Uh, the reassurance of the West of Scotland investigators, they saw the same sorts of event reductions. Acute coronary syndromes were reduced about 30 percent. Uh, fatal and non-fatal MI was reduced about 40, and the need for revascularization was again reduced by 35 percent. This was in primary prevention, not in secondary prevention. If we look at three secondary prevention studies, not primary but secondary, the first was the 4S trial, which was about 4,444 subjects largely Scandinavian, who had fairly high total cholesterols, 200 to 300. So you could argue that some of these had autosomal dominant dyslipidemia. And they were randomized to simvastatin 40 or placebo and followed for five years. And like in West of Scotland, the same events were reduced at about the same relative risk. So mortality, 30%, cardiovascular death over 40, and the need for revascularization about 35. This was followed by the CARE trial, which was a post-MI study where patients were randomized three months after their infarct to uh, provostatin or placebo. Now, these patients had much lower total cholesterol and LDL values than the uh, 4S trial. 
but again, they saw similar event rate reductions. Total mortality was not significantly reduced, but cardiovascular mortality was by almost 20 percent. Cardiovascular events, including non-fatal infarcts, were reduced by about 30, and the need for revascularization was reduced by almost 25 percent. So very similar to what the trend that was being seen in 4S and in the two primary prevention studies. And finally, the study that started first and ended last, the lipid trial done in largely the Asia-Pacific region, the long-term intervention with provostatin trial, 9,000 subjects who had car cardiovascular disease were randomized uh, with provostatin versus placebo, followed for six years, had reasonably good cholesterol values, 155 to 271, so better, very heterogeneous in terms of risk. Uh, you can, because now we know that your on, your on randomization cholesterol kind of predicts your event rates, right? The higher, the higher your risks, the lower, the lower your risks. And these patients all showed a 20 to 30 percent reduction in all of the endpoints: coronary heart disease death, fatal and non-fatal MI, and again, the need for revascularization was reduced. And I think it's fair to say, by about 2000, after we had seen the widespread adoption of statins, we started seeing at least some flattening of the growth curve of the need for bypass surgery and PCI. I remember in the early 2000s, our cardiac surgical fellows were having some trouble finding jobs because they weren't sure if uh, the market would be solid because the cardiologists were replacing a lot of cabbage with PCI. And, you know, frankly, fewer people were needing revascularization. Follow this a few years <clears throat> later, published uh, in early, the early 2000s, the Heart Protection Study, which was a Rory Collins study from um, Oxford, I think, uh, looking at just 20,000 subjects, largely in the UK, who had either coronary heart disease or diabetes, which we now think of as a CAD risk equivalent, LDLs that were a bit high, greater than 135, they were randomized to simvastatin or placebo. They also had a vitamin cocktail they threw in. And they showed, again, a consistent reduction in coronary heart disease events, vascular events, uh, and looking at the pr group of subjects you had diabetes, you had about a 35% risk reduction. So taken consistently, all of these trials showed that treatment with a statin drug really was really the only therapy we had, but all consistently reduced mortality, uh, non-fatal infarction, and the need for revascularization. So this sort of swept the country. Statins became big drugs, uh, highly utilized uh, therapies. There were, there were battles between people who were selling these drugs from the different industries industry groups, you know, competing uh, based on both scientific and non-scientific reasons. And um, then the, the medical profession started asking some, I think, very important questions, and that is, does everyone benefit from a statin or should we restrict it to those who need it the most? And do women benefit from statin therapy, the patients with diabetes and the elderly? And how old, uh, you know, how old is too old to treat with a statin drug? Uh, the 4S trial has been a treasure trove of uh, sub-studies in this regard. The 4S was the first to show that a diabetic getting a statin drug had a 22% absolute risk reduction in uh, the primary endpoint, which was coronary death and non-fatal MI uh, on statin versus placebo. So an absolute uh, reduction of, as I said, 22%, uh, so a number needed to treat, as you can see, of uh, 4 to 5 while the non-diabetics had a, about a 10%, 8 to 8 10% relative risk reduction, or 32, sorry, 10% absolute risk reduction, a 32% relative risk reduction. So about twice the benefit in diabetics versus non-diabetics. And this sort of differential of benefit in diabetics has continued to persist uh, now beyond. We also saw in 4S that gender did not matter, that women and men both equally benefited. And if you look at the elderly in the 4S trial, the in those days, it was defined as above age 65. I think today we would say that's really middle age. There was no attenuation of benefit in those over 65 versus those under from risk reductions in terms of overall mortality, coronary mortality, and the need for revascularization. And then I think the cost-conscious era of medicine set in, and we started asking ourselves, should everybody be on everything, uh, and does statin add incremental value to other medications? And again, the 4S trial showed that if you added statins on top of aspirin, you had an additional 34% risk reduction. Beta blockers, 36, and even calcium channel blockers, which were largely doing nothing, there was about almost a 40% risk reduction uh, with these drugs. 
This led to other trials being uh, undertaken, looking to see if other disease states would benefit. And uh, the first was that in hypertension. This was the ASCOT trial, the Anglo-Scandinavian Cardiovascular Outcomes Trial. This was an interesting study. It randomized patients to two types of blood pressure treatment and then re-randomized them to either a low dose of atorvastatin or placebo. And much to the surprise of everyone, the group randomized to atorvastatin had about a 2% absolute risk reduction or a 36% relative risk reduction in non-fatal MI and fatal coronary heart disease. So even patients just with hypertension seem to benefit from statin therapy. Um, in addition, uh, there was, of course, the uh, study that was undertaken largely to see how low we should go with LDL, looking at patients with clinically evident coronary heart disease and a history of revascularization. This was the treat to new target trial. So these patients were randomized to one of two doses of atorvastatin, 10 versus 80. And it was published in the New England Journal. Uh, and uh, what it found was that, of course, 80 of atorva was much more potent at lowering LDL uh, then uh, 10 of atorva triglycerides were also lowered. Uh, you can see that HDL was not significantly affected by either dose. Uh, uh, and you can see that uh, in terms of on-treatment LDLs, on 10 of atorva, you're aiming for an LDL of about 100, and on 80 of atorva, an LDL of about 80 or 70. So between 70 and 80 of 80 of atorva. So this really is a nice early study looking at true treatment goals of LDL and whether they made a difference. What was interesting was that on the treat to new target study, there was about a 22% uh, relative risk reduction or an absolute risk reduction of what, 4% or so, as you can see in this, of major cardiovascular events. And if you define that as major coronary events, it was similar. If you looked at non-fatal MI or death, the curves also were separate, and fatal or non-fatal stroke also favored much lower treatment or much lower LDL goals. And this probably was the first study to start suggesting that we should aim for an LDL uh, lower than we previously thought. And if you look at sort of the um, cholesterol treatment guidelines, uh, which were uh, coming out in the 90s and in the early 2000s, the goal initially started with an LDL of 130 and then 100 and then finally at 70, largely based upon this type of data. This also led to the company, the last, the last company to bring a statin out, AstraZeneca, wanted to test their product. Um, I remember submitting a clinical trial to AstraZeneca to test it in ST elevation MI. I was uh, an early advocate that statins might modulate what goes on acutely with acute coronary syndromes and even reduce potentially infarct size through a, what we thought was a nitric oxide mechanism. Uh, but we were turned down because they had said they actually had committed their entire research portfolio largely to the Jupiter trial, which was a very large primary prevention study looking at patients with no history of cardiovascular disease men over 50, women over 60, who had an elevated uh, CRP. And this was a study, as you can imagine, designed by Paul Ritker, uh, and uh, looking to see if CRP was a, a risk factor worth modulating. And this study was actually interrupted prematurely uh, because of benefit. Uh, I think the DSMB that my own colleague Bernie Gersh was on uh, later came out and said they did not expect to see such a robust clinical event reduction so quickly, and they struggled with what to do because they felt it was unethical to continue the trial, and they thought it was potentially scientifically weak to stop it so soon because of the number of events. And he said at the end of the, the day, the DSMB decided that it would just be unethical to leave people on placebo because there was such a profound reduction in uh, the primary endpoint, which was MI stroke cardiovascular death, and a need for revascularization. As you can see, it was about an 8.5% to a little bit less than 4% reduction, so almost a 50% relative risk reduction. This was a bit controversial when it was published in 2008, but I understand their decision-making, and I think they made the correct decision based upon how we understand clinical trials and the ethics of them uh, today. Death from any cause was also reduced, albeit not quite as profoundly as this combined primary endpoint. And when one looks at uh, where the benefit was, what I found quite interesting is that if you look at uh, achieving with the dose of resuvastatin a profound reduction in both LDL and CRP, 
versus achieving a reduction in LDL, but no really reduction in CRP, versus suppressing CRP, but not really lowering LDL, versus really achieving neither, you can see that there was a benefit from both reducing LDL and somehow inhibiting inflammation as measured by CRP uh, because the event rates were substantially lower, 0.38 versus 1.11 uh, if neither was achieved. And if you could achieve one or the other, you had about an intermediate amount of risk reduction. This is a very important observation to keep in mind as we go forward and look at acute coronary syndrome data. And here it is on a more graphic plot that I think clinicians tend to like. Here you can see uh, if you achieved a target LDL cholesterol of less than 1.8 millimoles, so multiply that by 38, 39, so uh, maybe about 70 and a CRP of less than 2 with resuvastatin versus placebo, you can see that you had a substantial reduction in the major adverse events at the end of the study versus achieving half that goal, either a lowered LDL or uh, a suppression of CRP. And so if you plot event reductions and event rates, rather, that event rate is, could be translated as event reduction as a function of on-treatment uh, achieved LDL, you can see that the lower we achieved LDL, the lower clinical event rates were over the last two decades of clinical trial data. And this is, of course, comparing placebo and on statin therapy. And others have looked at this. The cholesterol trialist meta-analysis looked at this and found similar reductions that for about every uh, one millimole reduction in LDL, you can see about a 20 to 30 percent reduction in major coronary event rates and about a 20 percent reduction in major vascular events. So it's all interesting statistical associations. Uh, suggesting that treating LDL likely is, is the correct method. Now, I got very interested in the 90s and what we could do with managing acute coronary syndromes. And a number of studies, and I've outlined those here, have looked at treating ACS with statin drugs. You're familiar with the A to Z trial, the uh, MIRACLE trial, probably not with the Florida trial, which was a fluvastatin study. You may not be familiar with the Provastatin study, Princess, that I presented at the ESC a few years ago or the Provostatin Acute Coronary Trial, which uh, was published much later after the study was interrupted. We got interested uh, in the late 90s. One of the fellows I had, Kevin Bybee and I, started looking at whether treating someone with a statin on the day of admission with a myocardial infarction would modulate coronary events, both mortality and the development of congestive heart failure. And uh, our initial study, data set was restricted to people from Olmstead County because we didn't want to bias the data too much with referral bias. And we were capturing 95% of all heart attacks in Olmstead County at St. Mary's Hospital anyway. And we found that those who were given a statin on the day of admission, for whatever reason they were given it, whether the doctor thought they were more likely to survive or they had a smart clinician who decided to give them a statin, whatever, there was a reduction in in-hospital mortality and reinfarction. So then we decided to broaden the sample size by looking at everyone in our coronary care unit database. We had a little over 3,000 patients who had had a documented myocardial infarction from 1988 to the time we did the final cut of the data, and then saw a significant reduction. Uh, so uh, there was an so association. Now, this is not cause and effect. This is not a trial. This is simply an observational registry. In-hospital mortality was reduced from about 9 to 3 percent if you happen to be treated with a stat. And your risk of developing heart failure was also substantially reduced. We weren't sure why this was. In fact, the first time we made this observation, we held the data over two years rechecking it because we thought it was probably too good to be true. We tried every way we could to figure out what the biases were with our own trial. And in fact, I then worked with Greg Fonero in the National Registry of MI, which was a little over 170,000 patients, and we saw the same observational association that if you were given a statin on the first day of hospitalization, by hospital dismissal, you had a much lower mortality than those who did not receive a statin until hospital discharge, uh, So, or those who didn't get a statin on the first day. And this was confirmed in the GRACE registry. In fact, Gary, we asked uh, 
Dr. Fox in the UK, if we could analyze the GRACE register, and he said, no, someone else is already doing it. So we knew that uh, we were in a race to try to get our paper out at the same time as GRACE. This uh, came out at about the time that the MIRACLE trial was soon to be published. Now, MIRACLE, there have been a number of MIRACLE trials, one with the uh, cardiac resynchronization. But this is the real MIRACLE trial, okay, before cardiac resynchronization. This was a small study that uh, uh, was really designed on the West Coast at the University of California at San Francisco with David Waters and Greg Schwartz. And then Greg conducted it as he was uh, moved to the Denver VA. And patients who had had an acute myocardial infarction, mainly non-STEMI, were randomized to a torvastatin, high dose, or placebo, within about four days of hospitalization. Not necessarily on the first day, but within 96 hours. And they were included only if the total cholesterol was less than 270, and if there was no planned PCI. So it was a lower risk group of patients. And what Greg saw was that by 16 weeks following randomization, the primary endpoint was what happened at 16 weeks. There was a reduction in a combined endpoint of death, non-fatal MI, cardiac arrest, worsening ischemia, and rehospitalization, showing that those randomized to a statin had a 16% relative risk reduction, about a 2% absolute risk reduction, versus those who were given placebo with a p-value that was at least borderline significant, 0.048. At the same time, uh, the Provostatin Turkish trial came out, which I thought was a fascinating study because, as you can recall back into the late 90s, there was a lot of debate about pleiotropic action to statins. Some of you may remember that. Do the statins do more than lower LDL? Do they play a role in fibrinolysis or antiplatelet efficacy? This was a beautiful study uh, designed by a group of investigators in Izmir, Turkey. Small number of patients who had ST elevation MI were randomized at the time of thrombolysis to either 40 milligrams of provostatin or placebo. And they were then followed up at six months, okay? So it was a six month study. 40 of them got provostatin, 37 of them uh, got uh, placebo, as you can see. And what they found was that uh, the risk of angina was substantially reduced in those who got statin versus placebo at six months and major adverse cardiac events were also substantially reduced. So this was a very small study. They had trouble publishing this. I was a peer reviewer for this study in uh, one journal, and I encouraged them to take the trial uh, and publish it, but it, it came out probably three years beyond when it should have been published. But it was one of the first studies taken, undertaken, and it's still a fascinating study suggesting that statin therapy may have augmented thrombolysis. Because you can see, even though the numbers are small, there was a substantial difference in those who suffered death acutely uh, and even in six months. This led to a much larger trial undertaken largely, uh, again, in Australia and uh, the Pacific region by Andrew Tonkin called the PAC study, the Provostatin Acute Coronary Trial. This was a study where patients were either randomized to Provostatin or placebo, and the Provostatin dose was divided into 20 and 40. And it was a fairly small study, as you can imagine, uh, only 3,400 subjects, and the composite endpoint was a 30-day endpoint of death, MI, or unstable angina. And of course, these patients were randomized in the emergency room, so it was fascinating. And ultimately, what the study showed was that those who got randomized to provostatin versus either the lower dose of 20 or placebo, so provostatin 40, had fewer primary endpoints out to 28 days. Now, this trial was prematurely interrupted because they just couldn't continue to recruit enrollment. It became a challenge because by this time, everyone was using statins. In 2004, I had the privilege of presenting the PRINCESS trial. I was on the steering committee of this study, uh, executive committee, and chaired the writing committee. Uh, this was a trial where we took patients who had uh, either a non-STMI or a STEMI, and they were randomized to provis sorry, not provostatin, cerevastatin or placebo within 48 hours of hospitalization. And at three months' time, they were then switched from placebo versus statin to open-label treatment, uh, 0.4 versus 0.8 versus 0.4 versus 0.8. So what we thought was that clinicians would be given the chance to cross over to statin after three months. The follow-up was at 24 months. Now, in 2001, in September, you probably know that something big happened in New York City and in Washington, D.C., 
But on August 8th of 2001, something big happened in the world of cardiology. The FDA and Bayer came to an agreement to withdraw cerebrostatin from the market. And so this trial was prematurely interrupted. And I remember we, were, we had a number of sites in the U.S. that we were managing at Mayo at the time. And uh, we started getting calls by 7.30 that morning from our site saying, we're reading on CNN that the drug is being pulled from the market. What are we going to do? And I got called by the study uh, managers. It's the first I'd heard of it. In fact, about a month prior, I'd gotten a call from someone at Bayer who said, in another trial that you were doing, I'd organized a, another trial with an inflammation called CRISP, did you see any rhabdo? And I thought that was a weird study. And I said, yeah, yeah, weird question. I said, yeah, we've had one case. What dose were they on? I said, I don't know. You've got the randomization code. So even before the study drug was withdrawn, the company was already looking into it. And later we asked them, about three days later on a teleconference, why they didn't tell us. And they said that insider trading laws prevented them from telling the executive committee they were going to withdraw the drug. So they pulled it from the market. And we were all left uh, really in shock. So we uh, had a couple of emergency calls, as you can imagine, and Bayer agreed to let us analyze the data if we could come up with a single endpoint. So what would you come up with as an endpoint if you had that choice? Gary, what would you ask for? Probably want to see mortality. Would you accept anything else based on the miracle trial? It's always easier when you see the data. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that you wouldn't have the numbers for more challenges. Exactly. I would have gone for a false endpoint, but that was consistent with prior literature. What what might that be? Okay. And would you accept ischemia driven revascularization as better than just revasc? Yeah, I have more questions. That was what I proposed. Thank you. Thank you. Now, you can attest that we did not discuss this before now, right? Because I think your idea is brilliant. That's what I proposed, and they went for it, and this is what we saw. So we looked at every patient. We only had, as you can see, a few thousand out of the total, I think, 20 that we were going to enroll accrued. And we looked at recurrent ischemic events, so in fatal, non-fatal MI, unstable angina, and ischemia-driven coronary revascularization. And within 48 hours of randomization by four and a half months, the curve separated, showing that freedom from those events was higher in those who were on a statin versus those on placebo. Isn't that interesting? We thought it was, and the p-value magically turned out to be 0.05. Now, we have never published that data because the sponsor didn't like this. They, they wanted this data to go away. They wanted the whole drug to go away because they were worried about liability, right? And so we never were able to get it published. And then later I got it included in a meta-analysis in JAMA with Greg Schwartz. So that data is available in the public domain. So that's where we were. And uh, the guidelines soon were written that you should start people on statins in hospitaliza during hospitalization with their index event. So the door closed sometime in the early 2000 era to be able to do any further randomized trials, much to my disappointment, because I still think that uh, we can modulate early events if we start treatment quite early. And uh, uh, I'm, st I'm still an advocate that there are pathways that statins might modulate, basically prenylation of proteins, that we could successfully modulate and prevent ischemic events early on and perhaps uh, reduce in, in the first three months post-hospitalization with an ACS event some of the clinical events. But I'm not sure we'll ever discover that. Well, in the AACS arena, uh, two other studies or so uh, came along. The first was Prove It, and this was a study undertaken, believe it or not, by Bristol Myers Squibb to prove that their lower intensity statin, propostatin, was better than high intensity atorvastatin because the pleiotropic effects of statins were equal to the LDL lowering effects. And so BMS paid for the entire study, to my knowledge, bought the atorvastatin. And then, of course, much to their surprise, uh, the atorvastatin arm had fewer clinical events than the provastatin arm, and that kind of closed the door on using provastatin, right? And then atorvastatin became the dominant statin. Now, with statin-associated myalgias, provastatin started making a comeback a few years later. That's an interesting study looking at outcomes. And interestingly enough, in this trial, there was data looking at whether one could suppress inflammation and lower LDL and get synergism. So 
let me start it by looking at this. If, if you ever ask the question, can you predict the CRP based upon the achieved LDL there, I think it would be fair to say that not even a statistician wildly intoxicated would interpret this as showing a correlation, right? The R is 0.16. In fact, this looks more like a shotgun splatter than it does anything else, right? So Paul Richter showed that in the study, there was really no correlation between LDL achieved and CRP, that they were sort of independent of one another. But that if you were on a torvastatin, you had much lower CRPs than if you were on provastatin in general. The median CRP was higher with provastatin than a torvastatin. And what I still think is one of the most interesting observations that isn't talked a lot about from the PROVE-IT trial is the same observation that Paul Richter showed with Jupiter, which is the following. If on treatment with the statin that you were randomized with, whether it's PRAVA or ATORVA in this trial, the on-treatment effect could not lower your LDL or your CRP to what were considered to be the appropriate threshold, 70 and 2. You had the highest clinical event two and a half years out, 10% clinical event rate. Now, this was values measured one month after hospital discharge. So one month of therapy, so pretty high compliance. People were still adherent as well. Uh, those who had that had no reductions in LDLs or CRPs to these cut points had the highest event rates. If you achieved an LDL below 70 and a CRP of less than two, you had about a 4.5% event rate versus 10% two and a half years later based upon your 30-day measure of CRP and LDL. And if you achieved one or the other, you had an intermediate risk reduction, halfway between achieving neither and achieving both. It's an interesting way to cut this data. And I think it's very patient focused because patients care about how effective the therapies are working. What Paul did not publish but did present at American Heart was a curve showing a 2% event rate. And what would you predict the 2% event rate curve required out here? A CRP of less than one and an LDL of less than 70. Isn't that interesting? How successful were the two drugs being tested at achieving that? Well, this is unpublished data. Paul presented this at American Heart. I don't think he's ever published it, but I took notes and created my own slide showing that if you were randomized to Provastatin, you had an under 15% chance of achieving both an LDL of less than 70 and a CRP of less than 2. And if you were randomized to a Torvastatin, you had about a 45% chance. Okay? So less than half of people on that really high dose of a Torva got to the ideal based upon this observation. And so if the goals really are an LDL of less than 70 and a CRP of less than two, over half of patients on a Torva and almost 90% of people on Prava never got there, okay? Now those of us who were around in the early 2000s and went through the marketing hype between the companies that sold some of these compounds have to now look back and recognize the difference between the science and the marketing here. Because you would have been led to believe that atorvastatin was the drug du jour for acute coronary syndromes, right? And people still believe that. They think it's the one statin. My house staff think everyone should be on atorva 80 when they have their acute coronary syndrome. And I softly remind them that Pfizer never got an FDA label for ACS or a starting dose of 80. And there are reasons for that. The company probably hasn't talked about those, but there are reasons for that. And that what's, I think, more important than starting on 80 of a Torva is looking at your patient's lipids and picking a statin that will get to where you think the appropriate targets are. And in my mind, that's an LDL of less than 70. And it's really impossible to measure CRP accurately at the time of an infarct because it's high. Uh, so I use the LDL and then I look at the CRP later. Now, a second study that came out in 2004 presented at the same time I did the PRINCESS trial was the A to Z trial. And many of you will recall that A to Z was a study looking at largely non-STMI, then it broadened to have STM, elevation MI, SIMVA 40 versus placebo. And then after a period of time, patients were up titrated to 80 of SIMVA and 20 of SIMVA, okay? 
So again, it was similar to Princess in that there was a statin versus placebo arm to start and then a crossover to statin. Now, this shows the evolution in clinical trial thinking in a way that we don't often talk about. Why do you think there was a crossover at about three months to statin instead of placebo all the way out to two years? Because remember the CARE trial that I showed you from the 90s, which showed that at three months' time, if you randomized the statin versus placebo, the statin group had better outcomes? We considered it unethical to continue placebo beyond three months at this time and juncture. So that's why there were crossovers. And at the time of the presentation, this trial was deemed as negative, okay? And that's what most of you probably remember about A to Z, that the event rates were similar, and so there was really no difference between a, a Simva dose of 80 versus a Simva dose of 20. And uh, Michael uh, Blazing presented this, and I said to him, why don't you reanalyze it looking at how Richter did prove it? And he said, what do you mean? I said, well, break it into quartiles of, you know, did you get the CRP and LDL below 70 or not? and get one or the other below goal or not, right? And so they did, and uh, what they found was that, uh, Dave Morrow published this, if you take the A to Z trial and you look at those who got the CRP of less than two and the LDL of less mm -hmm. than 70, at about almost two years out, they had event rates of 4% versus achieving neither event rates of 8%, so a risk reduction here of about 50, relative risk reduction versus an intermediate risk reduction if you've got either an LDL of less than 70 or a CRP of less than two, but your LDL did not fall. So again, it's very consistent that suppressing both of these is more important than suppressing one, and that there are thresholds at which I think when we treat, if we achieve, we can reduce clinical events. So is this all based on using statins, or is it lowering LDL? Is it the chicken or the egg, right? Because all the data we've looked at so far have suggested that lowering LDL with statins improve outcomes, reduce death, and the need for revascularization. But we know intuitively that there are heterogeneous responses to statins, right? Not every patient gets a robust response, and there may be non-LDL drugs to play. And we also have other lipid-modifying agents like cholestyramine and azetamibe. Uh, and azetamibe of interest also suppresses CRP or reduces inflammation uh, in some of the studies that I haven't shown you, right? So this led to the Improve It trial, which was really the trial undertaken to try to show that Vitorin or azetamide plus Simvastatin could reduce cardiovascular outcomes. Because you remember, John Castelline did an initial study in FH where the plaque didn't change, and so there was a real concern about whether azetamide was a drug that simply lowered cholesterol but did not affect clinical outcomes. And so this has been a very instructive clinical trial in several respects. It was a large study of 18,000 patients who were randomized at the time of their acute coronary event to either Simba 40 or Zetamide 10 and Simba 40 to try to lower LDL cholesterol. Later, the FDA required the investigators to up titrate to get LDLs in this arm at least at 70 because that was what the FDA considered the clinical standard during most of the follow-up, okay? And it was continued for a minimum of two and a half years, but it took a much longer time because the event rates were much lower. And what we saw, I wasn't involved in this trial at all, but what the investigators saw was that if you were on simvastatin alone, you could get an LDL of about 70, which is what the FDA mandated, versus the combination, you could have an LDL median value of almost 54, 53.7. And what was observed was a what was, you know, a 6.4% relative risk reduction favoring those on combination therapy versus those with simvastatin alone, okay? A 6.4% relative risk reduction, okay? So a number needed to treat here of about 50 because the absolute difference was 2%. But again, incremental. So the question is, one of the questions is, is this LDL-mediated? or is azetamide weekly adding benefit to a statin? Well, in September of this past year, the investigators of Improve It did the same analysis that has been done with Prove It and with A to Z, which looked at what were the event rates if on treatment you got the LDL below 70 and the CRP below two versus having neither target achieved versus getting the LDL <laughs> 
less than 70, as in the gray, or the CRP of less than 2 and in black. And again, it's a very consistent observation that suppressing both post-ACS offered a 10.9% absolute risk reduction, okay, versus achieving one or the other, which was about a 3 to 4% absolute risk reduction. And so what can be said? Well, the improved investigators say that lipid-lowering therapy with the combination reduces the event rates compared to statin alone. And what you'll see next month in Jack is an editorial that Joe Murphy and I are publishing, suggesting that on treatment, the combination therapy, and you get the LDL down to about 54, 55, falls right on this regression curve that's now an initially one published by Jamie O'Keefe, but has continued to be sort of consistently predicting where clinical events fall in terms of LDL lowering. And so it's my opinion that largely what we're doing with, with statin drugs is lowering LDL. And the lower we've taken LDL so far, the fewer events that we see, the more events we reduce. And so I think the statins are largely working for LDL reduction. And in ACS, they also are suppressing inflammation, which plays a role. But I think it's much less clear uh, how that interplays than it is in terms of LDL. Now, statins will never solve heart disease alone. It's a very complex problem. This is a slide from Peter Libby's publication showing a number of the trials I've shown you today. The secondary prevention, 4S lipid care, TNT, the primary prevention studies, Jupiter, west of Scotland, AFCAPS, sort of an intermediate secondary prevention, primary prevention group, heart protection, showing <coughs> the relative risk reductions from statin therapy. But what I remind you is that there's a residual risk, but not every patient gets a benefit. And there's still a lot of risk that's residual. And what we don't know is whether that residual risk is totally LDL driven or whether it's driven by other factors. And I would argue that it's driven by lots of factors as well as probably inadequate LDL treatment. Now there are currently two thoughts uh, schools of thought, rather, that are competing for lipid leadership in terms of what do we do. One is a goal-directed strategy, which is uh, LDL that's quite low. This was These were the old goals. And the other is the recent guidelines now that are almost three years old from the ACC AHA, which says that it's improper to interpret these trials based upon LDL. You have to look at uh, whether the statin was designed as an intensive LDL-lowering statin or a moderate-intensity statin, and uh, that's all we can recommend. Uh, what I would say is that we're going to have answers in a few years with the PCSK9 data, which will teach us a lot about whether there is a, an asymptote with regard to LDL, okay? We still do not know about HDL. I am skeptical having helped lead a series of studies in this and watching all of the CETP studies now fail except one. Uh, that HDL is something we can modify. I am hopeful we can do it because I'm working on an APOA1 Milano study with the Cleveland group now. I'm also helping uh, the AstraZeneca and Cleveland groups uh, with a triglyceride trial. And there may be other approaches. Uh, what we do know is that consistently getting LDLs lower reduces clinical events, okay? And that we can achieve that with high potency statins. We can achieve it with combination therapy. We're awaiting data with the PCSK9 drugs. So far, the data is very interesting. It's very provocative, but we still don't know about events. And so far, the CETP drugs have been a disappointment, uh, I think largely because we don't fully understand what they're modifying in terms of HDL subclass. And sometime, if you like, I'd be glad to give a talk about why I think HDL drugs have failed. Certainly, it's a talk I just put together a couple of months ago, but it's caused me to think critically about what we were, have done with trials and where we are. So we're, what are we debating now, not in 2015, but 2016? Does LDL goals matter? Or is it still just treat with an intensive, moderate or high intensity statin? Do we need to treat non-HDL cholesterol? Uh, can we add omega fatty acids? That answer is unknown. So far, the answer has been no, but we'll have more data, I think, with the strength studies in a few years. And uh, you know, should we look at longer-term risks as a predictor? And I don't think we have the answers yet. Uh, stuck here. There we go. Uh, this is what the guidelines say. This is what uh, other trials show. You can again see this is a nice data looking at atheroma volume as a function of on-treatment LDL. That the more we lower LDL, the more volume of atheroma we reduce. 
and that state all the studies and meta-analysis. And I realize that quoting a meta-analysis is like quoting metaphysics to a physicist, but uh, at least the meta-analyses suggest that uh, on treatment lowering LDL even below 50 may offer a benefit. And uh, we all need help. We'll have it when the trial data comes out. But I want to leave you with one last thought, especially for the fellows in the audience. In my time as a cardiologist, I've been on the staff of the Mayo Clinic 20 years, we have seen a dramatic reduction in cardiovascular disease rates, largely because of the leadership, places like the University of Minnesota, Cleveland Clinic, groups in the Duke and in Boston have done with studies and trials. It's been a worldwide effort, not just done in the United States. And we have seen uh, probably almost a 50% reduction in the drops in coronary heart disease death rates attributable to what we do as cardiologists, whether it's revascularization, treating heart failure, treating with lipids, and doing other therapies. What we're currently seeing, though, is that we are seeing a reversal in the benefits, that the increasing BMI of our nation and the rising incidence and prevalences of diabetes are reducing the gains that the generations of your faculty who are in the room today have achieved, and that your challenge as the future generation of cardiologists will be to stop this and bring this even lower, but at least help us come up with strategies to reverse the epidemics of obesity and diabetes and reverse the impacts they are having and all the good that has been done to date with pharmacotherapy, device therapy, and of course, lifestyle modification. That's the challenge we have, and that's the crisis we face. And uh, I'm sure you're studying it, dealing with it in the School of Preventive Health here. And we're all waiting as, as people in Minnesota, as people in the world, for, for new therapies to come out so that we can uh, stop these trends. Otherwise, all the gains in the last 20 years will be lost in the next 10 if we don't get a handle on what we are doing in terms of self-inflicted damage with our lifestyles and with uh, our weight and the diabetes issues. So I'm going to stop there, and I know I was told to leave a few minutes for questions, so Gary, I'll let you moderate those, and we'll go from there. I'm, you know, Paul Richter told me a few years ago he was doing a trial with a monoclonal antibody to test that. And I initially said to him, are you nuts? And he said, no, 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 I've dedicated my life and my lab to inflammation. And he explained it. And so I'm at equipoise about it. I don't know. I, we'll wait to see what the trials show. But boy, is it in therapy, you know, can we afford it? I don't know. Uh, but uh, it seems like we're entering an era of interventional lipidology, and this may be that. But I'm waiting on the studies. I'm at equipoise. I'm not sure. Because I don't fully understand how inflammation is playing a role in terms of what we, how we modulate it with statins. And I, would, I sometimes think trials get ahead of the basic science. This is one area where, where it has happened. So I'm at equipoise. There have been trials looking at and I don't think they've shown a lot of benefit. I think there's been a colchicine study, but Paul has a large study with a new monoclonal antibody, it's anti anti IL six drug. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the problems I've had is that I think I think the same way you are, which is to say we have to inject some degree of clinical judgment and perspective into this. If I'm getting an absolute risk reduction of one 
and a number needed to treat of 50 to 125, I'm not sure it's worth spending the patient's money because we, it's a big investment to achieve a small redu incremental reduction pharmacologically. We can, we can have them make lifestyle changes that will give a absolute risk reduction of 10 or 15 or 20 percent and achieve far more at really very little cost. If anything, it's a positive. It's a, it's a net positive, not a net loss of cost because they feel better and they're more productive and they're more economically benefited by how they feel. But that's what I do. I, th I think we have to be careful and we, that's where we need, I think, uh, mature judgment to guide uh, all, all who do research because we will continue to chase this to the asymptote that we can. And yet there comes a point when the law of diminishing return should set in and we should say it's just not worth putting our patients through a 12th medication and an extra 10,000 a year to achieve a 0.5% absolute risk reduction. I think we also, also we need to ask ourselves, what can we do to improve, improve adherence? We, we recognize that a third to half of patients aren't taking dual antiplatelet drugs for the time we want or lipid modifying therapies. Yeah, because they don't want to tell us they feel lousy and, and they're having problems and, and adherence would solve would probably produce more events than additional pharmacotherapy, so. With, with LDL? Not yet. Be, and I think you asked me this question five or ten years ago when you were at Mayo, so it's nice to see you here. Uh, I, I worried that there was at, at about LDL of 15 or 20. But so far, I, I don't think we've seen it. And if you look in indigenous populations where the LDLs are 20 or 30, they seem to be doing well. We'll know more when, when the PCSK9 trials finally show their entire data. There may be. My guess is the body is a very sophisticated regulatory machine and that the body needs a certain degree of LDL, whether it's 10, 15, or 30 milligrams per deciliter, and it will resist pharmacologic manipulation to take that much lower, and that it will kick in counter-regulatory systems that bring LDL back. That's why I think we have CETP, right? Because if you look at populations that do not eat meat, you can take your HDL, convert it to LDL. That's largely what CETP has done in terms of evolutionary biology. And so you always have ApoB-containing lipoproteins that are important for steroid genesis and other hormonal manufacturing that can be delivered to tissues when LDL and VLDL are needed or esterified lipids are needed. And so that pathway, modulating it with CETP inhibitors has not worked, largely because we've, we had a reverse mindset about what it did. Its job is to create LDL, not to create, not to promote reverse cholesterol transport or to create HDL. So, so far, I don't think there is a J point like we have seen with hyper, hypertension. Your patients uh, ever ask you, Scott, if the statins cause diabetes? And they do. do what you tell I tell them it does. I think we see, what, about a 1% risk increase in diabetes. I think it's especially true in those who are on the borderline who have some degree of metabolic syndrome. I do think the absolute risk reduction, though, for people with metabolic syndrome or diabetes from the statins are substantial and probably offset the benefit. But... I, you know, for primary prevention populations, especially, we have this. I have this discussion with them because I don't want them to be blindsided by it. Last question. So, you've been seeing that the actual LDL goals are going down into more four fifty things, and they are searching mm -hmm. at normal levels. At what LDL level do you think that the neurohormonal or the neurosystem starts to be dysfunctional in terms of the yeah, I think you're asking the same question Lynn asked, just a little differently. If you ask me to pick an LDL level to not go below, I'll tell you 30 milligrams per deciliter, because I'm very comfortable going that low based upon just epidemiology and looking at populations. Uh, and if, but I don't know that we know the answer to that, and this is all speculation. So, so with newborns, how do you look at mm -hmm. That's right. And large populations of, of people who gather their food and who don't have access to the meat sources that we have, have in the west of China, I'm told, the LDLs are running 20 to 30. Sub-Saharan Africa, the same. So, And if you look at uh, people who have PCSK9 uh, loss of function, who run around with LDLs of 30 or 40, there's a, no apparent impairment of any activity. Intellectual growth, physical achievement, reproduction, they all seem to do well. So.
So I'd like to thank you very much for coming Pleasure. to Minneapolis. Thank <laughs> you. Uh, appreciation. Um, be careful because there's a very large check under there. <laughs> <laughs> hey, thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank <laughs> you. 